So yeah, uh, thanks for actually showing up this early, because right now for me this feels very early even though it says 9.30. Uh, yeah, so that is the talk title. Um, it says seven, but because this lovely thing called inflation and because I don't know how to guess how much time something actually takes, there's more than seven. Um, if you use Twitter or X or whatever, my handle's there and the rest of everything else is there. Um, so this was actually created by Jerome Petazzoni and me. He unfortunately lands at 7 p.m. and therefore <laughs> I'm here by myself because I also may have a registered, like submitted for this talk at 2 a.m. in Hamburg and forgot to tell him that I submitted it. <laughs> Whoops. So yeah, anyway, uh, I am a developer advocate at VMware. Um, you may have seen me at Intel or Docker or Amazon beforehand, and uh, I do photography in my spare time. The QR code at the bottom of the page, assuming I didn't screw it up, is actually a link to these slides if you want to look at them afterward. I also learned a few minutes ago that part of the 30 minutes is five minutes or Q&A, so I might have to skip some slides depending on how things go. So yeah. Okay, so um, a lot of you probably have run on a local cluster of some sort instead of only in the cloud, especially since it doesn't end up costing extra money. So there's a bunch of different options here. Uh, there's things like Docker Desktop, you've probably heard of things like Kind, Minikube, there's Orbstack, which is what I'm running on my machine, since for whatever reason in the last couple weeks, Docker Desktop stopped working for me. Um, who here has used at least one of these things? All right. If you didn't raise your hand, maybe you're new to Kubernetes or you're not, you're not listening to me, which is fine. <laughs> Good morning. All right. So, uh, okay. Did you know that if you're using Kind that you can actually create a cluster that has multiple nodes? Cool. All right. I did not know this until pretty recently. Um, so basically, you can just give it some sort of YAML file and actually go and do that. So I'm going to go actually create that. All right. So depending on how the internet goes, um, hopefully this doesn't end up taking forever since I should theoretically have the image pulled. I may have tried doing this at uh, the pizza place last night and it, after four minutes I still didn't have Nginx running. So we'll see how it goes. All right. So some reasons why you might want to do that is like things like testing. Maybe you have some sort of daemon set that you want to be able to verify is, is actually properly running on a bunch of different nodes, or do I want to do something with like some sort of like node affinity or taints and tolerations? Like there's different things that you might want to test and be able to do that locally. Most of the time, if you just do like kind cluster create or use Docker Desktop, you probably end up having just one node. So who has heard of kubectl wait? Okay, I was just like, nobody? Okay. Uh, so there is, you can do waiting on a bunch of different conditions. So for instance, you could do a kubectl wait on, for your nodes and wait for those to be ready. For some things, maybe you want to make sure that you have all your nodes up before like having some sort of deployment. And maybe you don't want to end up having your deployment running all on the first two nodes that came up, for instance. So if we it did a kubectl wait here, um, it's already up, uh, so it's just going to go and say for each of them right now that the condition is met. If it, otherwise, it would wait for all of those to come up. And then you can do some sort of timeout. Um, there is a default timeout, and then if you need it to be longer, and I'll go into that a little bit later. So, yeah, basically just like making sure everything is up before you start spinning things up, which is super useful if you're doing some sort of like CI, CD type of testing stuff in general. Obviously, that may matter more if you're not just running it locally on a kind cluster. Okay, so who has heard of kubectx or kubeNS? All right, cool. A decent number of people. If you haven't, basically, they are um, some tools that uh, Amit Albakan created that basically allow you to easily switch con like between a context. So like if you have one or multiple kubeconfig files to be able to be like, hey, I want to switch between this cluster and this cluster. And then there's kubeNS. So instead of doing kubectl dash n namespace a billion times, if you are doing a bunch of stuff in a specific namespace, you can just use kubeNS and switch namespaces and do everything within that namespace. So if I were to do a create namespace, hello, and then if I did kubeNS, 
I can actually see all the different namespaces that I already have running on this cluster. So there's all the default ones that I have, and then I can go and switch over to my hello. Um, you can use like uh, FCF, which is I have installed to be able to actually be able to tab between them. Otherwise, you might have to actually type out whatever namespace it is instead of being able to scroll through them. And then if I were to do a kubectx, for instance, um, we can see a bunch of different uh, clusters that I have up and running at the moment. So I want to stay in my kind one. Okay. And can everyone see the whole screen from even the back room? Because sometimes I real I learned the hard way that sometimes the bottom of the screen can't always see that. Actually, I'll just do clear for now anyway. Okay, cool. All right. So like with being able to wait on nodes, you can do things like waiting on a deployment, for instance, for that to be up and ready. So if I were to go and create a deployment, so, okay, so then I can go create the deployment and then I can do a wait on the deployment as well. And then for instance, this one is super fast. When I was trying to do it yesterday, it just, you know, five minutes later, it was still waiting on me uh, and telling me, hey, there's nothing up there ready. Like if I did a K get deployments, we can see that it is true that it is up and ready. So basically, like you can do this with a bunch of different types of resources. So if we uh, look at this next one, there, who here has done a dash o JSON path? Okay, cool. So if you haven't, basically it lets you like go through your JSON and pick a specific like say for this one, you can go through items, status, and then get the different types of conditions. So based on that, you can figure out like, hey, what are the types of conditions I can wait on for a specific resource? So if I go, oops, oh my goodness, it's going the wrong way. Okay. So if I did that, I can see that I can wait on both available and progressing. There's different ones for different types of resources. And so like, it doesn't always show all the conditions, like for jobs, there's some, things that don't specifically show up, um, and just making sure that you know, hey, I can check for maybe a deployment, There's, I can see what different things you can wait on. Okay. So then you can also do this thing for services as well. So like I could go and expose the deployment, and then you can do actually wait for endpoints. As of um, a pretty recent version of Kubernetes, um, you can do this dash dash four and then give it JSON path. And then you can actually, instead of having to go and be like, fault find wherever dot IP is, you can actually do dot dot IP and it'll go and find that for you. So if I go and do expose, so I can expose that. So then I can wait for endpoints. And then it's already up because this internet likes me a lot better. Um, so basically, you can just do things like that with it. Um, there is also the ability to do that if you have, some, like, if you decided, hey, I'm going to do a type load balancer. So basically, you can wait for the endpoints for, to be up, but then also you can specifically go for with the service to be able to see that there is uh, the external IP is up, and that you can actually go that actually has one that you can go to look at afterward. So uh, the default timeout is 30 seconds for uh, cube cuddle wait. Um, some things might take longer than that, so you might want to do something like earlier where I had the wait for like 10 minutes, for instance. You could also set it to zero, which basically just checks once and then reports whatever that status is. You could do a negative value, which is, I guess, the longest time, which is a week. Um, I don't know what you're doing if you're waiting a week, but uh, if you are, let me know, I'm curious. And then you can also do like a cube cuddle wait for and then delete as well. Okay, so there's a couple things here where it's like, oh, I added it later and I added a half because the changing all of the numbers is kind of a lot. <laughs> um, so there's also a tool called CAP, which is part of the Carvel tool suite. Uh, if you saw Whitney and Victor's talk yesterday, there was mention of that. So basically, it kind of acts in a way of like having the cube cuddle wait. So you do a cap deploy and you give it some sort of name. So like I am calling my app hello. 
and I give it a YAML, which just has a deployment there, basically. Um, but it'll wait for every single resource type that is there, and it'll actually start printing out things telling you what is being created. If you go and do a cap deploy on something that you're changing, it'll actually tell you that things are being changed. So if I actually try just doing that here, and you can also see that since I didn't give it a dash Y, it is asking me if I want to continue, but like you can actually see like what is being created. Um, I already have the deployment, so that's not going to work so great right now, so I'm not going to actually continue with that. But basically, it'll actually spit out each thing as it's creating it. And then there's a bunch of other tools that are there as well. So like there's YTT for YAML templating and a bunch of other stuff. So if you want to look at the other things, you can go to carvel.dev. Okay. So deployments, uh, turning a deployment on and off again. Have you literally tried turning it on and off again? It sometimes fixes things. Um, so one way to go about doing that is to do a cube cuddle rollout restart and on the deployment. So basically what it ends up doing is it just ends up adding an annotation. And then based on that, it will trigger a rolling update. So if I did a cube cuddle, if I do that, we can see that it was restarted. And then if I did a get deployment, let's see. And I'm really bad at typing when I'm nervous, so uh, let's see if this worked out. All right, cool. It worked. Uh, so yeah, it said that it was restarted, and it is, yes, it is November 5th um, and 9.41, so yay, that just happened. Okay, cool. So, if we, and also if we end up getting a deployment uh, here, we can see like just a bunch of different things with that as well. All right, so basically that's one way of going about doing it. Um, if you actually want to completely turn it off and then turn it on again, um, one thing you do is you can actually scale to zero. Who knew that you can scale deployments to zero? Most everyone. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm glad you're all learning something new since you already know everything anyway. Um, want, who wants to do my talk for me? <laughs> but yeah, so basically you can scale it to zero where it's not just having a, like, where you're rolling out a new one immediately afterward. And then you can go and uh, scale that back to one whenever you decide to. One of the times this is super useful is say if you're using some sort of cloud provider for Kubernetes and it's caring about how many pods you have running. All right, but why though? <laughs> so um, some reasons are that you might, again, want to turn off things that aren't in use, but you don't want to completely go and just like remove every single deployment that you maybe need to run in like a week or whatever. Um, maybe you want to do something with some sort of auto scaling. Uh, there's some things like with auto scaling that it might rely on like CPU utilization, for instance. And there's, it's a little more complicated if you are dealing with front ends, but there's a bunch of different things there. There's also a tool called Kata that you can go and look into as well. Okay, so who knew that you can connect to a service within a different namespace without having to have some sort of like load balancer or something like that? Okay, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Cool, <laughs> okay. So uh, basically, say if I were to just go create some sort of namespace, and so if I were to co create this deployment here, um, and I expose it, I can basically create use external name to go and have it be the, uh, so yellow is the uh, one that I'm exposing here, and then blue is with the namespace, and then you give it dot service dot cluster dot local. And then you can end up having it where you just, like for instance, if I did a run test and I could attach it and then I could end up using uh, that service external name that I have here. Um, let, all right, we can, I don't think I can actually have this working on the cluster that I currently have set up because of just how it works. But um, later I can try showing that on a different cluster if there's time, which I don't think I will. But this is a thing, uh, slides, you can try it later. All right, uh, so generating a YAML manifest. So a, a lot of the time when I was first trying to do this, being, I would be like, oh, hey, let me go to the docs and go and copy paste something and then I'll modify it or go to some website or I guess now everyone's using chat GPT and be like, hey, create a YAML manifest that does this thing for me. Um, 
some of that stuff works if say you're trying if you're working on like the CCAD or CKA or whatever, but like for instance, for the CCAD, when I took that, you could use Kubernetes docs and nothing else. But again, going and searching, which I may have done, uh, takes a little bit too much time. So there is actually a way where you can just go and just uh, do as you normally would with creating whatever resource that is. Uh, give it like dash o yaml if you want the yaml. And then you can give it a dash dash dry run client, and basically uh, that will end up giving you YAML. So apparently I like going through slides a little too fast, but um, if I were to do deployment, you can basically see, and if I did it with this tool called like you, I can make it pretty because sometimes people like color, some people hate it, I don't know. Uh, but basically you can see that it's created the YAML and based on that you could add things like for instance with some of the role bindings, uh, there are certain things you can't do with flags um, and then therefore you might just create a base one and then make some changes um, afterward. All right, so then who has heard of kubectl patch? Okay. This is, this is a lot. Okay, everyone, I like you all. You all know a bunch of stuff. I mean, I've heard of it, but I haven't used it. Okay, all right. Maybe I should just do that instead. Who has actually used X thing for each thing? All right, quick. Who's used kubectl patch? Okay, that's a lot less. All right. Thank you for my new question. Um, all right, so basically you can patch to uh, make some changes in what, instead of having to necessarily do like a kubectl edit and then scroll through for trying to edit some specific thing. So right now we have my deployment, which as you probably saw, is just running a regular Nginx image. If I were, for instance, I could be like, hey, maybe I want to try changing uh, the name and like my image to Nginx Alpine because Nginx maybe takes too long to set up or something like that. So let's see what happens when we go and try doing this. So if I do that, um, I can actually run K9S, assuming it likes me. And um, who's, who has tried K9S or heard of that? OK, cool. Uh, so for those who haven't, basically it's a prettier version of running through your terminal to be able to see what is happening. Um, basically, you can actually like go through it and watch it as things are changing. For instance, so, and the, uh, for a second I looked at different ones and it's doing different things. But um, basically, uh, you can see if there's like an error happening. You can see things coming up and running. This one is going to give an error um, based on the fact that if we look inside, what actually happened with my patch is it has my initial one and it created another one, and it's going to fail because they're both trying to use port 80. So. For instance, depending on what you're trying to do with the patch, you have to be careful as to making sure that it's actually doing what you want it to do, because this obviously is not what I wanted. That's been my experience with patch as well. <laughs> it works for some things, and other things it like destroys you. Yeah. Yeah. So not, not the best necessarily, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so. If you did what I just did and didn't want something, you can actually do a patch to be able to go and remove. For instance, I want to remove the uh, container that I just ended up adding to it. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't know how to actually select by like a array item by like the value of being like, hey, I want the smaller one to go away. If there is one, come talk to me later and tell me how to do it because that'd be cool. Um, so if I were to go and actually go patch it again, OK, so if I were to like look at K9S again, um, we can see that it's back to having one. OK. Um, so then you can also do things like uh, you can decide, hey, I want to actually see specific um, uh, column names of like say I want to see the architecture, I want an instance type. You can decide based on like what you actually care about seeing for a column names and just having those specific things show up. So like for instance, this might be useful if you're like, hey, I want to see what different instance types I have, and there's the two different ones for mine. They're all it's not really going to show anything. They're all going to be the same because it's running on my kind of cluster. Hi. Can I rename columns? Can you rename what? Can Ren I rename columns? Like if I want to rename an instance type. It's a little complicated. 
and you, you would have to use either the, the Go template or the JSON path template. Well, that sounds like work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you just make a shell script for it, and then you never have to do it again. Wait, 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 all right, um, and then you can do things like checking like uh, which controllers actually own the pods. So for instance, if I were to do this, let's see. So I can go through and see everything that I have uh, like up, and then you can actually see, hey, like for hello, for instance, it's owned by Rupkisa, and just like what the different things are that own it. You were ahead of your head. <laughs> okay. So uh, instead of what I did with the patch, um, you can actually use kubectl set. Who has used kubectl set? OK, cool. This is a better question. I like this. <laughs> actually, who's heard of kubectl set? OK, no, this isn't just a better question. Just the answer is no one. All right, except for two people. Cool. All right, so basically what I can do is I can use kubectl set to change different things. So I can change like what my image is. I can change, set whatever service count is. You have to be careful with some of these because you can do like dash dash all, for instance. If I did it for all on my service count for a service count that doesn't exist, then now I just kind of you know made it so that all my stuff starts failing. So you have to be careful. Um, and then so like for instance, if we uh, did a set image. So if I did a k get deployment. We can see that it's now nginx alpine. Yes. Uh, where do you get the list of attributes you can set for each object? Um, so that is an excellent question. Um, I don't actually know. Hmm. Isn't there an explain command? There is an explain, like but I don't know. API? I don't know if you can do it for every single thing. Um, And then it was dash R. Yeah, I couldn't remember if it was dash R for cursive because every tool is different. But um, I don't know if you can do it for literally everything or not. Uh, but if you want to see every single possible thing that there is there for something, you could. But it depends on how well I'm not sure. it worked on that section documented using Open API because you can specifically request like one field and it should give you a description and possible values. But not everybody documented their open API as well as others. That got me through my CKA exam. <laughs> it's good. It's a good, really useful tool. But yeah, so if you haven't seen kubectl explain, ta-da. Um, thanks for adding to my slides. All right. <laughs> so yeah, there's uh, some things that don't work. Like so, the dash s selector doesn't work for everything. So for instance, you can't use that for a service count. There's, it's a little complicated. Um, all right. So then there is also a uh, kubectl auth, uh, can I, and dash dash list. Who has heard of this one? OK. So yeah, basically, if you decide to give someone RBAC permissions, it's kind of important to make sure that you actually gave them the right permissions. You, didn't, you don't want to accidentally have given them full access to your entire cluster, for instance. I mean, it's a little bad if you just didn't give them the access they needed, then they might be annoyed at you. but. Could be, could be worse. But yeah, if you're admin, you can also check someone else's as well and just basically use that. And there's several other uh, plugin tools that are out there as well that you can add for also dealing with checking these types of things. Um, all right, so there is a different, you can use a dash dash watch and then actually do output watch events and it gives you a bunch more information. So like if I did, Okay, so then basically, like if I was doing a bunch, like starting up a bunch of different stuff, you can just see a bunch of the information as it's going through and doing that. And it waits on them. And obviously, I'm not setting up anything right now, so there's nothing new showing up. Super useful. Okay. So then, who has used, actually, we're just going to go with heard of on this one. Who's heard of Gron? Nobody. Okay. 
I'm doing something right. <laughs> okay, so uh, basically you can use Gron to see a bunch of like the, like what the path of something is. So for instance, I can actually see like JSON to item status conditions and actually like that's me uh, memory pressure and just like go through a bunch of the different things there based on whatever you are specifically searching up. So if I were to try doing that, Assuming I actually installed Chrome. Yeah, okay, so mine has a bunch more, and then based on whatever thing you have, you can uh, use that for it. Okay. So who here has heard of Nixery? Okay, cool. I'm, I'm enjoying the seeing one hand raise thing. This is a lot better. <laughs> um, all right, so basically say if you, maybe before you would have like some sort of Docker file and be like, okay, I'm going to go and start with whatever base image that I want, but I need to, I need, oh no, I don't have curl. Or maybe you're like, uh, okay, which specific Docker image for Ubuntu or whatever has curl and has my other thing or you have to install it and it's just kind of chaotic and annoying sometimes. Um, you can actually use Nixery if it, for basically what this thing is doing is it is doing a Docker run, pulling down an image that actually has everything that you have between these slashes, it will have in that image, assuming that it's something that they actually have. So for instance, this one will have shell, Terraform, kubectl, helm, curl, and ffmpeg. So basically the image just gets created on the fly, which is super useful, and then you have it all in there, which curl was probably the one that I needed the most. Um, so there's a few caveats. So like images are AMD 64 by default. Um, you can get an ARM 64 image by adding ARM uh, 64 at the front. It's just more of the slash things. And then, but there's not any uh, multi-architecture image yet. So since I was told there was supposed to be time for questions, um, here's the end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, questions for Tiffany? Buddy, come on. <laughs> okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so a quick one. Um, way back when you were showing the, the JSON path that you had some expression that you were looking for IP. Oh, it was when you were doing the weights and you had an expression that ended in IP. Dot, dot, IP. It, dot, that's, dot, dot. IP. that's it right there. Mm -hmm. Does that look specifically for a JSON path that ends in the key IP or any path that has the key IP in it? Uh, it looks for something that is just uh, IP. Okay, so yeah. it's... It's not like, if, if something else had blah, 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 IP and the IP is at the end of it, it's not going to have that. If but like if there was like dot IP dot something else, would that show up too or no? Mm, let's see. I don't actually know the complete path. I think path. the JSON path standards, you put dot star after it to show you so, everything under that heap. Okay. So we tried it with, so I guess if we wanted, if you wanted something like, you mean like, ad, for instance, addresses.ip or ip. Uh, Do the target ref. Target ref. Com, and, yeah. 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 Dot star should be all of them, according to okay. Jason's uh, Jason path standard. Uh, so just replace time with star. Oh, that's what. No. No. Nope. Oh, interesting. Or at least ZSH doesn't like it. So then but... my, other, my other question was about Nixery. Is it possible to specify specific versions of things? Uh, that one I don't know. I've never tried it with any specific versions. So I don't know. I'll have to look it up in their docs. Let me know. Oh, so it looks like it would have worked if you weren't doing this. Uh, a wait for endpoints. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So if you'd just done like a, a get or something. Don't know if I need. Yeah, it because it'd be. I don't know what yeah. specifically is the dash for dash for, and it would anyway, have to be Jason Path. Specific. Learn it. It's good. Like a full on Jason Path thing. Not a four, yeah. Okay, anyone Dash else? All that. Okay, then thank you so much, thank Tiffany. You. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Great.